Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. What is up? Higher Learning is on. It is I, Van Lathan Jr. And it's me, Rachel Lynn Lindsay. I see some cheap blondes behind you again, Rachel. You don't see anything. It's blown out in the background. You don't see a thing. It's blown out. Ba ba background's blown out. What's that book behind you? What? Why is your TV on? Let's keep talking. Look at your curtains. I I'll tell you where I'm at. I'm in the goddamn Why Western people where you in New stay? Orleans, okay? Behind me. So who cares? What are they going to do? Uh, could you turn that down a little bit? I knew you were going to do that. I already turned it down. Oh, sure. Turn it down some more? <laughs> I don't um, hear anything. All right, okay. how, was, how, how, how was your trip? It was really bad. Thank what you happened? for asking. What happened on the trip? I had to go. I went to Charlotte last night, mm -hmm. and I left at this time. So I could hurry up and get back as soon as I could because mm. I had to go interview Chesley's parents mm. for Mental Health Awareness Month. That must have sucked. Yeah, it was what? really, it was really tough. Super tough. Um, did, was that their idea to interview or did like, was that like an extra thing? It was both because she did, the mom and her stepdad did Red Table Talk and Red they talked. Red Table Talk. Mm -hmm. They did Red Table Talk because of mental health awareness. And mm -hmm. the mom really wanted to dispel like a lot of the rumors that are out there were surrounding Chesley's death. And she felt like she was in a place to talk about it. And so she did. And she felt like it was very healing for her. She revealed things um, about Chesley that people didn't know before about the severity of her depression. And so, yeah, it was a, she did that on Red Table Talk, but talking even more and doing that interview is hard, hard is, the, is the hardest interview I've ever done. What were the rumors? I didn't hear any rumors surrounding her death. Just like that people didn't believe she actually committed suicide. They were trying to say that she was mm -hmm. murdered and they were calling the police. They were calling the police and, you know, trying to give tips and certain things like that. Um, then just people were just saying awful things about, you know, like to the mom, like, how could you not know? And, you know, different, just different things like that. She touched on the interview. Like, I don't want to get in all of them, but. When does the interview come out? Is this for extra? It is for extra. It's going to be in three parts because we didn't just want to focus on what happened. We want to talk about her and as a person and what a light she was at extra. So it's in three parts of celebrating her, talking about what happened and kind of education in regards to high functioning depression. Um, and mom really gets into that, which I think is both educational and informative and really talks about the things people assume because they might have been depressed, but they project what they were feeling on somebody who is suffering from severe depression, debilitating depression, um, which was Chesley. And then the last part is kind of like, what can we do? She had certain wishes in her last message that she wanted to carry out. How can we honor her legacy? How can we uh, build on the things that she was trying to do while she was here? What defines high functioning depression? I've never heard that term before. I hadn't either until Chesley, but basically it's that when most people think of depression, they think the, the face of depression is one way. You can't like get out of bed. You, you can't, can't do anything. Yeah. Right. But someone who was like Chesley or had high functioning could mask it, which it just became too exhausting for her in the end. So to everyone else on the outside, she was laughing. She was smiling. She was doing everything. She was accomplishing all these things, but she'd go home and she would cry. And mm -hmm. she, you know, like, felt like she was in mourning constantly and thoughts of suicide and death were ever present for her all the time, but she could fake it mm -hmm. where not mm -hmm. everybody can do that. And so the people mm -hmm. only, only super, super close to her even knew she was suffering from depression. Most people, people who worked with her every single day had no idea. That's so scary. It's and very, so very, very frightening. <clears throat> She, I, I really hope the part airs where the mom talks about, her mom talks about April, I'm call her by name. April talks about, um, you know, everyone's like, check on your strong friends, check on your strong friends. And she's like, that's great. 
but it has to be even more than that. And she goes into that because somebody like Chesley will say, I'm doing okay. And then you'll keep it moving, but they're not okay. And so her mom kind of talks about different ways you can ask or at least say something to that person to make them see it in a certain way. Um, very informative. Very informative. Um, the Mental Health Awareness Month stuff uh, this month, it seems like it's more, even though we're quote unquote out of the pandemic, it seems like more people are struggling. It's like I've seen it, and you were going to talk later on about the, the the sister at Southern University. It seems like more people are struggling right now. I talked to so many people that are going through it. Very, mm -hmm. very tough times. So much stuff on everybody's minds. It's like ridiculous. It's 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 kind of it, you're so right. I don't know if it was, you know, there was a lot of community, even though we were separated and things that were normal and kept us going were taken away from us, but there was still like this sense of like, we're together and we've got it. And I feel like that has gone away. Plus with everything that's going on in the world, um, whether it's in this country or outside of it, it's just a lot. And, and, and honestly, there's just like a lot of feeling of hopelessness, just, just to be very honest. And I think that's what people are feeling. I was I was reading something or talking to someone about the after effects of COVID that people don't talk about. Like after you have it, the way that you feel and um, reinserting yourself back in the world is is tough as well. Reinserting yourself back into the world after you've had COVID, like mm -hmm. after you've isolated and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. People are struggling I, with that. I huh? felt I felt that after you you just. I can't describe it. There's just a, a weird feeling because you've been so alone and so isolated. And then I don't know if there was a little bit of shame. There was a little, I don't know. I just felt very awkward coming back out of the house. I can't explain it. I felt very alone. I felt, it, I just, I, I don't know. I can't explain it. And then I, I talked to someone, maybe I was talking to a therapist and she said that. But that's actually a very common thing. Like a post-COVID mental situation. Mm -hmm. hmm. I don't know. Has everybody on the has everybody had COVID except for me? Donnie, did you get it? Yeah, I think I've had it twice. You had it twice? Yes. He thinks. I tested think? positive for it once. The second time my sister had tested positive and I had symptoms. So I just assumed I had it in quarantine myself. You didn't you didn't test? No, I didn't. I just stayed home. Interesting. Trudy, did you have it? I thought I had it once, but I tested negative. So I don't really you know. Might have, you might have still had it. I maybe, think so. Maybe people still had it. It's, it's interesting. I think that I, I don't know, man. I wonder if we're ever going to be happy again. You know, like yesterday, everyone was at uh, my mother, was like at the Airbnb. Everybody was out there. We were having happy times and stuff. You know, we're doing the, my mom made a big pot of gumbo and the whole crew from Hip Hop Homicides on We TV was there. And we're all hanging out and we're all lounging and cooling. And no one, hold on, how can I put this? We're all happy, but everything that we have to talk about is sad. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're yeah, all happy. exactly what you're saying. Yeah, like we're all happy. Everything is happy, right? But we're talking about, Fucking Roe versus Wade, COVID numbers, Ukraine. It's all sad. Everything is sad that people are talking about. So it's like, even in the happy times, there's still this air of uh, of weirdness. And even like the music that we get, I don't know. We don't get anything that truly makes us feel dope. Kendrick released that amazing video. Uh, we'll talk about it later. But it's a drag. <laughs> it's a drag. Drag. It's so powerful, you know what? but it's a drag. The only song I've heard left lately that really lifts my spirits. Hit it, Donnie. I wasn't ready. Hold on. <laughs> animal, animal, animal game. Animal, animal game. Animal, animal, animal game. Animal, animal game. That's the Animal Games theme song right there. So, Donnie, I love 
that you do. That's exactly it. That's exactly by the way, the by the way, that brings me joy. I, I'm aware of some criticism. Some people that are trying to take joy away from us on the Animal Games theme song. There are what allegations happened? of plagiarism. <gasps> Donnie brought them to my attention. Donnie, would you like to uh, inform Rachel about what the streets are saying about the Animal Games? Did song? you? It's yeah. not original. The Reddit is saying that the Animal Games theme song, or at least the melody of it, is very similar to something that is in Super Mario Brothers 3. Do yeah. we have sound? Oh, who knows yeah. that? Super, Super I know Mario it. It's 3? my favorite video game of all time. Donnie, uh, play the song if you can find it. Do you have it queued up? Because because uh, you were playing Mario shit. I think you were ready to ambush me with it. I beat you to the punch. Donnie, you betrayed no, me. No, no, no. See, that I'm actually sure. wasn't Mario music. That was some, that's It was just similar. But I got it right here. Hold on. Play it. Play the song. Oh shit! Animal, it is, it is. So here's the situation. Turn it off, Donnie. That's what so here, you're subconscious. So here's the situation. Here's the situation. I every song you here's do. Here's the situation. From here on out. This is why I don't fuck with the Reddit. That's why the Reddit are a bunch of soulless, lifeless jackals. I'll, I'll tell you why. This is why I don't fuck with the Reddit. This is why. But that could be true. I've played that game so many times. <laughs> obviously, wait, wait a minute. I, obviously, mailbag time is a remix of Closing Time. But it's you called that time. out. I called that out. I have played Super Mario Brothers so many times. I love Super Mario Brothers, right? I could have, I didn't even know that I was doing it. But Shout you know out what? to who found that. Reddit is hypocrites, and I'll tell you why. All you guys listen to, right now, Jack Harlow has the number one song in the country, and it's fucking Fast Life. It's fabulous by First Fergie, class? one of my favorite songs. First Class is the remake of fucking Fergie's fabulous oh, song. Yeah. That fabulous yes. song is one of the most amazing pop songs ever uttered by a white woman. And you guys. Glamorous? Glamorous is a great song. Do you, are you saying fabulous? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> wait, no, wait. First he called it fast class. Then he said fabulous. Class. <laughs> Don't try to she talks about her dad in the song. She loves her dad. She talks about her dad in the song. Because my daddy told me so. I love that. We first game with the cheese. Every day. Jeez. I love that song, but you guys are listening to that shit. But I can't remix Mario for Animal Games. I didn't even know I was doing. Jack it. Harlow credited Fergie. Uh, who? You I wear. credit you? Yeah, he's he credits Fergie with Glamorous. When did he say that in the song? I didn't. When he released it. Oh, did he? Yeah. 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 Well, they even saying that Kendrick stole the. Uh, that Kendrick <gasps> stole that video. <laughs> he stole the white boy. White boy said he stole the video. He said. Did it. you see the original? Did did, like, the, did 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 the did the guy do the same faces as Kendrick? I'm not in the lie, video. Man. I'm not gonna lie, man. A nigga did the same thing. I'm not gonna bullshit you. I'm no, no, no. Just it's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. But but not the same people. It's not the same people. This nigga did. Okay, Lil well, Wayne guess who else people. did that? Guess who else did that? Michael Jackson. But that doesn't count, though. That's different. Okay, let me tell you. Oh, hold on. Before we get into the show, let me tell you why Michael Jackson is different. Let me tell you why Michael Jackson is different. That's different because what Michael Jackson was doing, conceptually, Michael Jackson was turning. The only person that was in there was Tyra Banks. She wasn't famous yet. Michael Jackson was just morphing people into other people, right? There were, that was uh, wasn't one. Isaiah Thomas a face? Was it? I don't think so. He might have been. <laughs> he might have been. I, I don't think there was a Marley in there. <laughs> I don't think he was. But what I'm saying is, but what I'm saying is, look, those people were turning into other people, but that's different than one guy standing there and morphing into all of these famous people, which that's the same concept. So this white guy, I guess he's named JK, the white rapper. He from Jersey or whatever. And he says that he did that same thing. We'll talk about it later. Have oh, you seen really? it? Really? No, yeah. no, no, no. And it's like he did Lil Wayne and whatever, whatever. And he's saying that he feel like Kendrick stole it. They both under the universal umbrella. I'll be honest with you. Maybe Kendrick did steal it. And I say Kendrick should steal it again. I say he should steal all of this guy's videos. Oh how God. dare you? How dare you? How dare you get comfortable enough to where you open your mouth to besmirch Kendrick Lamar, JK, the white rapper. Um, but I really didn't realize if, if, if it's Animal Games, I really I wasn't trying to. I think that's Closing hilarious. Yeah, I, I don't care. The song brings me joy. It's your. It's a hit. It's my favorite song you've done. 
Oh, it's better than mailbag time? I don't know. It's better than mailbag time. It's a hit. I love animal games. I'm, um, I'm like the OT genesis of making up songs. I mean, I have a couple of hits, but I can't consistently, you know. Um, wow. Shout out to OG Genesis. Wow. Shout out, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Shout out to OG, OG Genesis. OG Genesis. I don't mean that. No, I'm talking about you giving yourself all these hits. That's what I got, I'm I got referring hits. to. <laughs> I got hits. I got hits. Y'all, here's the thing. You know what happens to me? What happens? And to you this think? is happening on this podcast, mm -hmm. and it's happening mm -hmm. with the Reddit. Mm -hmm. There's something about me that the closer I get to people, the more they don't want to see me succeed. That's not true. People from the outside looking in, they love to see me succeed. But the closer I get to people, they don't want to see me shine. I wrote about, I wrote about this in the book, Fat, Crazy, and Tired. Tells of Trish's transformation. People Man, Thought Warriors are some of your biggest supporters. That's horseshit. That's the Thought mean. Warriors and this entire production crew, mm -hmm. Team Rachel. All right. Um, and the production uh, We got to, we got to, we got to, <laughs> yeah. Donnie, Donnie let me down. All right. Um, Interesting bit of the day here. I don't know if this. Do you is... want to do that? Oh. What happened, Rachel? Rachel's having the worst day ever. The no good, terrible day. Rachel, what just happened? Jesus Christ! <laughs> wow. It's, it's a. She didn't order the right food. Chipotle. What they give you? I can't hear. What her. is that steak? They it's, it's, nothing's right. There's tortillas in it. There's guac. Calico. Everything is going wrong for me today. I cannot. Rachel's, Rachel's whole day is ruined. What happened just now? Tell us what happened. Starving. I have starving. not eaten. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't even want to talk about it because I know this is bougie problems, but I bought a certain ticket. I bought a first class ticket. And when uh -oh. I went to the when I went there, they bumped me out of it and were like, You're lucky you have a seat. And they gave me a middle seat. They were like, There's nothing you can do about it. I'm like, last night. I like, here's my ticket. It's confirmed. I got my seat. I checked in. No, they were like, forget about it. You're lucky you have a seat on here. Okay. So I sit in the middle. So I haven't eaten because like, oh, I'll eat on the plane. I come from this interview, emotionally exhausted. Mm -hmm. Now I'm kicked out of my seat. I haven't eaten. I'm hangry. Mm -hmm. I have an issue with the car picking me up. I got bad news about a family member mm -hmm. on the way here. Right. And now I just want to eat Chipotle. And it's the wrong order. It's What'd the wrong order. You? What'd they give you? I don't know. They gave me burritos, little talk. I mean, little tacos. They gave me steak. They gave me they guac. Gave little, I don't eat. They give you little <laughs> tacos. It's just like, it's not, like it's so, it's it's not so funny. Day. So this was funny. This was funny. They gave Rachel little tacos. <laughs> Wait a minute. So they have regular tacos, Sorry, right? Rachel. It's funny. They have regular tacos. And then they go, you know what? Fuck it. You put a little tacos. So they went smaller tacos. Did you get did you get any chips and guac? I don't do guac. I don't eat guacamole. So now you just gotta eat. Now your whole life has been reduced down to salsa. That's fucked up. Let me tell you what we should do. Let's say what I'm gonna do. Right now, I want you to send me your address. I'm gonna send you, you and Brian. I don't know if he's gonna eat it. I'm gonna send you dinner from Bavel, the best restaurant in town. Okay. What's and you made a you made a face. No, you know what? It's dinner's off. You made a face. <laughs> <laughs> dinner is Babel is such a great restaurant. You made a face. The dinner is off. Eat your little tacos, nigga. <laughs> Babel is like the best restaurant. In you, know what? you literally made I'll a face. I'll take the laugh. Eat your, I'll eat take your the little laugh. tacos. All right. Um, something not so funny happened. Uh Kevin Samuels passed away. Um, crazy, crazy fucking shit. So uh, I believe this is Friday or Saturday. Um, somebody check that for me. I'm pretty sure it was maybe it was, it's. Uh, it was it was Thursday. It was like right after we taped. Yeah, right after we taped, right after we taped uh, I, all day long. It was going on. I didn't see it. But still Thursday night, it was still touch and go about whether or not he had passed away. Friday is when everybody came with the actual, uh, the actual final word that he had actually passed away. And of course, Kevin Samuels, who was a very controversial figure, you know, people were, there was talk. 
You know what I mean? There was talk. Right. Obviously, there were a lot of people who were not pleased with the way Kevin Samuels made his public uh, persona, the way he built his career. And there are some people who looked at him like a fucking prophet. So uh, wild. It, it was it, it was tough. Um, Kevin Samuel's mother mm. talked about the fact that she learned about his death on social media. She said it was a terrible thing for social media to put that out. I didn't even know. I hadn't been notified. His mother's name is Beverly Samuels Birch. Uh, there was police from the East Paces Ferry Road, excuse me, police responded to a call at East Paces Ferry Road um, on Thursday morning regarding an, a, a person injured. That person ended up being Kevin Samuels. He was unresponsive. He is dead at 56. Uh, before we get into the terrible situation regarding his mother, what do you think about the death of Kevin Samuels, Rachel? I think anybody, any death is a tragedy. That's someone's son, brother, uncle. He wasn't married, but, you know, so I'm not going to say husband, but it's somebody's loved one. So, you know, if you have ill thoughts towards someone for what they did while they were alive, I think you keep that to yourself. And it's not an opportunity to kick someone when they're already literally down. So was I a fan of Camp Kevin Samuels? Absolutely not. That is well documented here on this podcast. But the fact that people took it as an opportunity to pile on or even debate him in death, to me, respecting the fact that someone lost someone that meant a lot to them is what you need to do. It's just, I, I just will never understand how people think that this is a free opportunity to like get at Kevin Samuels. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Let me ask you this. When people say respect the dead, um, which I do, which I believe in, we guys know mm -hmm. that we've, we've talked about this before. I, I had problems making uh, jokes and reveling in the death of Rush Limbaugh, who is an enemy to freedom. When people say respect the dead, Rachel, who is continuing to eat on the podcast, uh, like, why do you think, why do you think it's important to respect the dead? What do you think, what do you think it's, I'm, I'm hmm. wondering for you, what's the, I know that we should do it. And, you know, we Southern folk and being that we Southern folk, we look at this a certain <laughs> way. Um, but what do you feel like is the reason that we do? I guess, you know, when you say respected, it's almost respecting the people who are still alive, mm -hmm. who loved that person. I guess maybe that's where I'm thinking of. You, you mentioned the mother, how the mother found out. Mm -hmm. She found out because people were all over social media and honestly, either talking about him in a disrespectful way or reporting on his death before and family had even confirmed it. There was just all this speculation out there for hours. It wasn't until you woke up the next day that you found out that his death was confirmed, really. And so when I, you say respect the dead, I feel like it's more so respecting the living that loved the dead one. Mm. That's, taking, that's taking the super, the, you know, like the, the spiritual side out of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. also, um, good karma. it's just it's, it's bad to me now we're uh you know we have we're here here at higher learning we have the uh we are home to some of the most vicious pr pr progressives in the in, <laughs> in the entire internet so there are going to be many people who are going to be like fuck kevin samuels uh he died and being that he died say whatever you want about him um i thought about this I was, not a fan, I was not a fan of Kevin Samuels. I thought right. about, first of all, two things. Number one, it's interesting having to have a take on somebody dying. Right. It's interesting to, to have a take on someone dying. But you know what? I have one. Oh, okay. I do have one. So I don't have a personal relationship with Kevin Samuels. Didn't know him. All right. I disagreed with Kevin Samuel's opinions on a lot, a lot of things, you know? Um, I do think, however, there's something that we miss about Kevin Samuels. And what might that be? That the misogyny that Kevin Samuels uttered and the degrading of black women is as much reflective on our culture as it is him, and let me tell you why. This is not my take on his death. This is just something that's interesting to me. When people say that Kevin Samuels uh, 
dissed and berated men to they're right he did you can go find video you can you can go find videos of mm -hmm. kevin samuels talking that same shit to men yeah he did the issue is number one and he knew this because he said that if he were to get on women this way that his social media would go up he started off being a guy who was telling men how to be better and he talked about the fact in a video he said if i turn around and talk to about women things would change so there was seems to be a clear pivot from him wow um but what i'm saying is that it's not just what he was doing that was more uh it's not just what he was it's not just the fact that he started talking about women is that when he started talking about women that's what got him noticed mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's not it, it's not just that he because he did talk about men but nobody gave a fuck when he did that right the, right. Re, the response to kevin samuels is really a lot of men who believe what kevin samuels believed and didn't have the heart to say it didn't have the balls to say mm -hmm. it or weren't in a place where they feel like they could say it so they made him into an idol and a demigod of how they felt about black women. And that is something that we don't even need him to be here to legislate. We have to talk about each other. We have to talk to each other about why shitting on a black woman will make you famous no matter who you are. Fresh and fit, to be honest with Lord you, Jesus. we played a part and I'm doing it again on this podcast in making Fresh and Fit famous. We made them famous because the minute that they that they shit on black women, you become famous. The outrage in me doesn't let me not like approach that. And at the same time, there's so many people that are gonna be like, those guys are right. So if you want to drop a cultural bomb and, and make people pay attention to who you are, it seems that black ladies are the easiest ones to pick on in that instance. And that's something on the, on the other side of Kevin Sanders' life that we have to talk about because there's gonna be another guy that comes along and tries to fill that void. And the whole shtick is going to be like, let me tell you why these bitches is fucked up. And are we going to make this guy famous again? Are we going to do the same thing? That's that's a lesson right there. So interesting. I don't know if I believe that guys who put men like Kevin Samuels on a pedestal necessarily really believe that. Or if just someone like Kevin Samuels speaking that out there empowers them. Right. So it's not even that they necessarily believe it. It's just those words. You're, they're calling themselves high value men and they ain't got nothing, no value at the table. But someone like Kevin Samuels is putting that out there. Now they take those words and empowers them and they throw that at women or black women in particular to make them feel less than. That's what I think was the problem with Kevin Samuels. That's what I think he empowered sorry ass men to be. He gave them something to hold on to on to and dangle over black women, put them down, build themselves up. But I don't know if they believed it. It's just something that they could use. So we're saying the same thing. Mm. It's not something that they believe about themselves because there's no way to like God to like, so, okay. So there's not, it's not something that they believe about themselves. It's what they believe about women. So telling a woman that True. she, yeah, telling a woman that she doesn't have enough value to be attractive to a man that has a certain amount of value widens the pool of men who are under that man. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, if, if, if you, if you are not, quote, if you're not a quite high value man and there's a woman that you feel like should be in your dating pool mm -hmm. and she's looking for a quote unquote high value man. And there's someone that comes along to tell her that she shouldn't be looking for that man. And she should be looking for you. That guy mm -hmm. is now your white knight. He's your Lancelot. Mm -hmm. Right. Because he's right, telling right. you, he, he's, he's expanding the potential mates that you have, right? Mm -hmm. And if there are men who are not really setting the world on fire, who still talk about whether or not they would have sex with whomever, when nobody gives a fuck who they would and would not have sex with, like nobody cares. You know what I mean? But right. that ego needs, it, it needs an avatar. And Kevin Samuels was that avatar. Hey, you women shouldn't expect this. Your expectations are too high. Lower your expectations. Now, Leon is in play. And Leon yeah. goes, Kevin Samuels is talking that real shit. But my take about Kevin Samuels isn't, isn't even about his life or about his, uh, what he thought. It's about his death. 
So about a week before Kevin Samuels died, he was talking to ladies and he was saying, you know, if you're over 35 and you're something like that, you're average. It was always talking about people that were average. He was talking about people that were above average and people that were below average. Even when he was talking to the guy, he was talking to this one guy. He's like, how much money do you, how do you make? The guy tells him, he goes, how big is your dick? The guy tells him, he goes, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, how much do you weigh? The guy was a short and a portly fellow. He said, like, you're below average. You're this and this and that. How can you expect that? Right? Fine. The thing that struck me about Kevin Samuels' death is that it was below average. Go on. So if you want to live a life, because most of the time we all talk about how we're going to live. We're living people and we're stuck in the way that we live, right? We talk about how we want to live. We talk about what we want to do, how active we want to be, the places we want to go, the people we want to meet, things that we want to do. But we don't really consider how we're going to die. Nobody wants to think about that. Nobody wants to think about the situation and the conditions that they want to be, uh, that they want to have surrounding their life when they pass away. No one wants to think about that. But if you were to think about it, what would it be, right? You would say, hey, I want to die with people who love me, I want to die surrounded by people who love me. I want to die in a lot in a lot with a lasting connection with people. I want to die in a situation to where uh, there's somebody who cares about me that's right, right there. So when I'm going, I can be able to see them, right? I can be able to be near them. And we don't often ch- we don't get to choose that, right? We don't get to choose that, but we can live a life that puts us in a position to get there with a greater percentage, which is all we're asking for anything. If you do everything the way the Kevin Samuels book was supposed to be done, it doesn't guarantee you that you're going to have a great mate. It just gives you, according to him, a better percentage chance that you find a great mate and be happy. That's what we're trying to do. So when I think about the fact that if we believe the details of his death, that he died alone as a divorced man with two different with, 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 with two different exes, right? Divorce man, two different exes, alone with a woman who he had just met the night before, um, who called the police uh, when he had, when, when the cardiac arrest earlier in the morning. For, any, for everything that Kevin Samuels preached, he didn't die surrounded by people that loved him. He didn't die up under a woman that he could look at. I'm not going to, blame anybody or make any judgments for him having some casual sex he didn't die up under somebody that uh that cared about him that was staring into his soul someone that was his teammate that he was building something with someone that had a, he had a lasting connection to he didn't mm-hmm. die surrounded by grandkids and and um and grandchildren he died in a way that to be honest with you if i'm keeping it all the way real he died the way that my father died the woman that took my father to the uh to the emergency room was a girlfriend of his that we had never met and my father's decisions that he had made and i'm i'm i don't know how else to say this my father's decisions that he had made in his 40s as it related to his wife and his family put distance between him and them to where if i'm being honest with you um we wouldn't have known who he was fucking at the time because we weren't around because he had had a family and because of the decisions that he made, other things like that, the family was gone and it was splintered. So the person, he wasn't around his wife of 25 years when he passed away, 27 years when he passed away. He wasn't near his son or his daughter when he passed away. Like I looked in, the, uh, in my DMs and this woman had DM'd me. And I didn't even get the DM on that same day because it came in, hey, this is so-and-so, I know your father. I just dropped him off at the hospital. It doesn't look good. And I thought to my dad, I thought about everything that my father did, what a way for him to go out, the family that he built. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. And I thought about that as related to Kevin Samuels. And I'm like, all that shit that you talked, did you build enough bridges towards people? Did you build enough roads to people? In your life, all of the standards and all of the selective ways that you put on this and all of this manicuring and all of this curating that you did, at the end of the day, 
Did you build a museum that you had to live in alone? A museum of ideas, a, muse a museum of thoughts, a museum of all of these weird ways to look at people, right? You take a human being, something that is one of the, the most prized possessions of God in the universe and tell them that they're average, did that work for you? And if there's a mm -hmm. lesson to be taken from that, if there's a, for me personally is, it's not about what you're not in life. It's not about the money that you don't make or the body that you don't have or the person who you aren't and what you should be expected. It's about what you are. Mm -hmm. And when I heard what he said, it was limited. He put a bunch of people and made them put a bunch of very superficial and a lot of times unrealistic like labels on themselves. And to me, that's not what people are about. So this is a long winded way of me saying, I was sad for him. Just like I was sad for my dad. Like I was like, I was, I loved my father. I didn't know Kevin Samuels. I was sad. I was sad that that, that, that guy to me was in a jail cell of his own creation. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I took from it. And I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I don't want to diss the man. I don't want to do any of that stuff, but all of this shit that y'all be talking, this goes out to everyone. All of this shit that y'all be talking, make sure it fucking works for you. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm not in any place to judge. Cause I got some of these same fucking things in my life that I got to deal with. And I'm, I'm struggling and grabbing on not to be that same way, but just make sure all of this shit is working for you. Cause more times than not, it don't seem like it'd be working. I have nothing else to say after that. That is extremely powerful and it's so true. And it's like the whole thing about building sandcastles. That's exactly what he was doing. Mm. Building sandcastles. And I think it's easy for people to grab onto that superficial stuff. It sounds good in the moment. It makes you feel good in the moment. But at the end of the day, those words, those thoughts, those ideas, it's not, it's not bringing you comfort. Woo. What'd, you, what'd you think about the Kendrick Lamar video? Rest in peace, Kevin Samuels, though. I hope you... Rest in uh, peace. I hope you, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm just... That, that just struck me. What did you think about the Kendrick Lamar video? Did you did you see it? The hard part you know, five. Kendrick is one of my favorites. I've always said that on this podcast. I love mm -hmm. Kendrick. Always have. Um, I thought it was genius. Loved it. I loved every single piece of it from... When I, like, I saw it, I was like, oh, wait, he has a new part to the heart. So I was like, this is going to be good. And then I saw the video later and I said, oh my gosh, nobody could do this but Kendrick. Everything that he was saying was so true. And Kendrick is one of those rappers where like, you can't listen. I couldn't listen, just listen to the song and mm -hmm. take it in. I had to listen to it. Then I wanted to read the lyrics. Then I wanted to watch the video. Then I wanted to read the lyrics while I watched the video. Like I, I wanted to fully try to grasp what it is that, that Kendrick was trying to say. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I fully did. I didn't. The only part I got was really the Nick part, rest in peace to my brother. Yeah, I did. It's going to take five more listens. I'm going to be honest with you. Kendrick don't be I right. Did. It's going to take five more listens. Like, I, I didn't really get it. I'll be real with you. Here's the thing. This is the thing about art. Sonically, I don't know if I'm going to listen to that song that many times. Sonically, does that like is that like a song that I'm like, damn, that shit sounds great? No, not really. And really, to be honest with you, the lyrics are so message heavy, heavy that sometimes even some of the rapping is like, I mean, it's good rapping subject matter, but I, I don't hear, it's like he's in and out of pocket and, and sometimes it feels like he's, I, I, Kendrick, I'm just saying, it's not my favorite song, but the entire art package, song plus visual, plus that part about Nip, it is oh by my far gosh. the best thing <laughs> that has come out this year to me and it's not my favorite song he oh just has gosh, a way wait. of making that art he has this line in there in the nipsey part where he says because you can't help the world until you help yourself and i can't blame the hood the day that i was killed y'all had to see it that's the only way to feel i was like oh my god that's like, that's like, and, and doing that with nip's face did you notice that every single time the face changed the line was about alluded to that person. Yes. Okay, you got that. Yeah. That was probably the basic. <laughs> yeah, that was the point of the whole shit. <laughs> 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 
it's funny. Man, did you realize the faces changed in the video? No, I didn't say that. Let me ask you a question. I didn't say that. Aren't there some faces in there that you feel like, like, why OJ in that bitch? You know? Like, (laughs) it's like, like, you know, you got- I thought you were going to say, why is Jesse in there? Ah, I can see why Jesse's in there. Look, Jesse got, Jesse mad at me, but I'm still team Jesse. I don't give a fuck what y'all say. I am still team Jesse to this said day. You, can. you said he was guilty, but Jussie. you put your team Jesse. This is what I'm saying. I'm saying even if he was guilty. You already said it. <laughs> Jesse deserves our support and our continued support. I can't wait to do something where I can work with Jesse, even if Jesse is mad at me. Team Jesse, team Jesse, team Jesse, team Jesse. Jesse should be in there. Because Jesse is okay, a misunderstood say black. Say it man. one more time. He's still not going to pick up the phone right now. I haven't called him. He's, he's, um, still, he's still not going to respond to the DM. And I'm not <laughs> deleting the fucking thing. But I haven't called him. I haven't, uh, I haven't reached out. But, I, but also, I'll be honest with you. I, um, I, don't, see, I don't think OJ should have been on. Okay. Could you explain why? What would... Like, I gotta well, I see. Oh, I gotta see what he said. At so the these are the people that are OJ. on. These are the people that are on there: Will Smith, OJ, Yay, Kobe, Nip. Am I leaving anybody out? Jussie. That's it. Um, okay, so those are the people that are on there. Isn't OJ the odd man out in that situation? I'm trying to it understand. Depends what he's saying. It depends what he's saying lyrically. Yeah, when OJ comes on, on, he starts off with the Jay Z, the Jay Z line. The hard part five. I I, I think that I I haven't really, I haven't really digested it enough and I haven't broken it down enough. I need to figure out what the OJ part is. I'm telling you when he start when he hits the, the hoves line, um, that's when OJ pops up. Hmm. What's your thought about OJ? Do you like, do you think, do you look at OJ as a misunderstood black man? No, I don't. Um, OJ's face pops up when he says, I said I do this for the culture. The 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 song itself is an indictment of the culture. Because Correct. the thing there, yeah, the things in the song. So that's uh, OJ. That makes sense. Oh, we just figured that out because oh, because the culture got behind OJ. Ah, look exactly. at this. We just figured it out. The exactly. culture got behind OJ and we were fucked up to do it. We were fucked up to do it. I'm gonna be honest with you. We we don't, oh, I was, about to, I was about to be a biggest white man's nigga ever. Hold on for a second. <laughs> I was about to say, we owe America an apology for that. What the whoa, fuck? Whoa, 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 What's his name? What's his whoa, name? Harry? Terry Crews. Harry? Harry? No, no, Harry. no, no, Harry. Harry you Linux. got our biggest percent. Whoa. Harry Linux. <laughs> Literally. You know what? It, Why it was don't about we to just go out. ahead and, and, and superimpose Harry's face right now? On oh, my face. Well, I just turned into Harry. <laughs> <laughs> fuck no! Fuck that! I was about to, it was fucked up though. Well, come back to us. Come back. Yeah, come back. I, I almost did. I almost did. But the, but the video is great. Um, how excited are you for your Kendrick's album? I'm very excited. May 13th. Here we go. Nobody talk to me. Nobody call me. I need to listen to the whole thing. We're probably gonna be listening to it for a month, trying to figure it oh, out. We're gonna be listening to this for like a month to figure <laughs> it out. Trying to figure it out. It. But if it's this is a taste of what we're going to get, mm-hmm. I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, let's, let's take a ride down your favorite avenue, BLM Avenue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rachel put this in the, in the group chat. <laughs> we were getting tagged in it like crazy. <laughs> Did you see that? Oh, I can't wait to see what Van and Rachel has to say about this. Well. OK. Well, Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Colors admits Using six million dollar mansion for parties. <laughs> Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Colors has admitted to throwing two parties at the organization's swanky six million dollar Los Angeles mansion, despite previously suggesting she'd never use the property for personal gain. The 38-year-old told the Associated Press on Monday that she hosted her son's birthday party and a gathering to celebrate President Biden's inauguration at the six-bedroom property last year. Colors recalls her earlier decision a lie. 
I look back at that and think that probably wasn't the best idea. She previously issued a statement denying she'd ever lived there and used the property for a personal gain after its purchase was revealed, triggering allegations of racism from BLM. Also in this article, which I read, she talks about how she felt like the home was the perfect waypoint between a base of operations and basically a kicking spot. They didn't want a, they didn't want a traditional base of operations. They wanted a place they could go and feel comfortable. And they also wanted a place where they could have a podcast studio. Stop it. In Cut the shit. Cut the shit. Okay. If that's what she said, if that's how she felt, then she should have said that from the beginning. Then trying to pretend that it was something that it was not. The proof was in the pudding. The paperwork had never been filed. It had never been reported to taxes. And when you found out that this article was coming out, then you started saying, oh, we're going to use it for this. 17 months that house sat there. We thought it sat there doing nothing. Now we found out it was it was hosting parties and we already knew about the YouTube. We, now we hear about her son's party. I'm sorry, this is, this is a really, really bad look. You should have just been honest from the very beginning. Hello? The gate put, hello? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my dad says, it's hello just, in the house. It just tied the game up, yeah. I know, mm -hmm. I have, we have the game on here. Mm -hmm. Is your TV ahead of ours? Because the game's not tied. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's probably ahead of mine. Horford okay, Patrice, like listen, honest. Patrice, you're deflecting. Mm -hmm. I know these are your friends. I don't know. Well, Patrice let me not do that. Let me not, <laughs> let, let me not do that because this is really about Patrice. Mm -hmm. um, no, but in all seriousness, if she had been honest from the beginning, it wouldn't look as bad. But the fact that now she's backtracking and saying things that she didn't say and admitting that she lied, how do you move forward at this point and believe anything that she represents? At this point, She's tainted that organization, like not as a whole, but you now you can't separate BLM from what she did. You can't. I'm not saying talking about the cause and what it represents, but the organization itself, you can't separate it from her transgressions at this point. Because now she's coming forward because she got caught. What else are you hiding? After she denied, 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 denied. denied. It puts everything that she says at this point in jeopardy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Fuck. Damn, damn, damn. God damn, man. Niggas always on some shit. What the fuck, bro? You know what, bro, man? I'm not gonna lie, bro. Like, can a nigga just have somebody to believe in? Like, niggas is always on some shit. What the fuck? Like, I swear to God, man, it's like. <laughs> How much? Like, you just it's, knew it's, what was at stake, though. You no, knew what was first at of all, stake. Okay, so I want to look at this. First of all, I want to look at it this way. All right, there's a lot of work that Fuck. still can be done. There's a lot of work that still can be done, and we, we got the chance to get everything okay, get it done. You know, I don't want to continue. There's somebody wanna, else. It, it it's but god damn why man is that a is there a for sale sign in front of the house yet i don't know nigga fuck fuck that <laughs> fucking house you know but here's the thing like here's the thing and, and i'm being serious about this so let's take this let's try to let's take it let's have a little higher learning on this okay so this is the thing i'm not making excuses for anyone i'm saying this is the uh so there's a gentleman by the name of Banyard Rustin. If you guys don't know who Banyard Rustin is, um, Banyard, Ru Ban Banyard Rustin, what the fuck? What's so funny? Oh, uh, Banyard, Banyard Rustin is a, uh, he is one of the most important figures in civil rights history. Uh, he was a gay man during this time. He was very close with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He did so much organizing, SNCC, all of that stuff. Manny Russell is a fantastic mm -hmm. guy. I'm trying to do a movie on him. Uh, a lot of the reasons that he is not on the tips of everybody's tongue is number one, there were tremendous amounts of, uh, of amazing people during that time. And number two is that he was gay. And being that he was gay, 
during that time, they weren't going to have him as front and center as he as they did everyone else. He's a very important person in the development, Martin Luther King Jr., blah, blah, blah. Later on in his career, there were younger people, younger people involved in SNCC, younger people involved in the movement that accused him of selling out, that accused him of being bankrolled by different lobbyists and things like that, and like selling out to people, selling out to different organizations, right? Okay. The reason why I bring him up is because of this. Sometimes there is a, the reason why purity is sometimes a bad uh, benchmark for black leadership is because our traumas are so much deeper and they make purity hard to attain, right? And that's always a frustration with me and it's always very sad to see. We come from places that don't have a lot of money. We come from places that don't have coping mechanisms. So if we're being honest, Malcolm X coped by being away from his family and Dr. King coped with women. You know what I mean? Like Malcolm X coped by stuffing his face with sweets and had all this anxiety. Dr. King coped with women. People get on, Jesse Jackson get on, gets on, there's all of this talk of grift. Al Sharpton gets on, there's all of this talk of grift. We don't know how to, we don't know how to deal in America with some of the things that come along with being successful at stuff. So it seems like, the reason that this is frustrating to me is it seems like we're destined to fuck up every single opportunity that we get because we never had shit in the fucking first place. Patrice and the rest of these people started this off with, I'm sure, the greatest of intentions, right? But they get to a situation, what you do when you have $90 million, you start flossing, you start trying to like do shit that you ain't never done before, and you forget that there's a fucking reason why this shit is going this way. Then you fucking lie about it. Got me out here looking like a fucking dummy. And every single time, that's why it, that's why we should only, that's why the grassroots are the only fucking roots that should matter. You got to keep with the grassroots because you need people before they get sullied by whatever America has to offer and has been holding back from us. This, you're right. Every, nothing that you said is wrong. This is fucking terrible. Why you need to have an inaugur party, inauguration party in the first place in the house? So she can stunt. Why, we, why are we stunting? And it's just, it's just sad that like with, and this is not at all, all activists. I'm not saying this at all. Activists are on the ground. I meet amazing activists every day talking about uh, what I'm talking about. Like I said, Chicago, Pastor Brooks, Inglewood Barbie, even though Inglewood Barbie <laughs> mad at me. Um, like it, I meet amazing people who are devoting their whole lives to this and they would fucking change their circumstances, their city. Pastor Brooks and Inglewood Barbie had $90 million. They changed Chicago. But they get in and they fucking throw a party. Niggas! <laughs> like, like what like what somebody like, what? has to say it somebody has to say it i don't think that anybody like when you talk about purity and then you talk about things people did to cope with i don't think that that's necessarily the same thing that patrice was doing i just no 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 i can't give her an out i can't i can't because what she's doing what she did is so detrimental because so she is right in the sense that she was like, these people are out to try to get me. Yes, people are looking for you to fail. People are looking for you to mess up. You knew that once BLM really came to the forefront in 2020, you knew that when you got all that money, you knew people would be watching you. And you used that to say that you weren't doing what you were doing. You knew if you got caught how bad this could be and how this can set a movement back. Now people can have an excuse to say, but this happened. But this, how do I trust my money with this? That's the problem. Shouldn't we still stick by them though? Who's them? Because remember, it's just who? her. I don't want I don't want to put the other, Even I don't want to do colors. what old Even boys did. Should we bring Even him back on? We should bring him back on. Right? <laughs> do, do, should we bring him back on? Whatever. Because I take the L. Unlike a lot of people, I can admit, and I'm fucked up, and I take the L here. Bring him back on. You know what? Fucking coronation for Sean Campbell. Bring Sean Campbell back on here. He's now King Sean. You know what I mean? Bring Sean Campbell. He was wrong about what he did. He was wrong. About Alicia. Alicia. But bring King Sean back on here. 
have his little ass sit down there and get at me. Like, like fan, fan, I told you. Yeah, but you this came at him. You, there was no, I you came didn't at him because I want these kind of organizations. I, I want oh. these organizations. Rachel, but you know what, though? Be honest with you. You like excoriating people. That's your thing. That is you're not super, true. You're, a, you're, you know how some people are king makers? <laughs> they call people king makers like Oprah's a king. You're a soup maker. Rachel's I'm not. Soup maker, Lindsay. I'm not. Like, but, but the people that I, like, she put herself in the kitchen. Okay, she's, <laughs> she put herself there. She has an apron. She's got a pot with her name on it. <laughs> but look, but look, but look, okay. Before we get off this, hasn't Patrice Colors done more good? Like, come on, Rachel. Like, of course. Like, is, so what I'm saying is, I don't want us always good? to just I don't want kick to do motherfuckers. A- I don't want to do it more likely than not. Has she done good? Absolutely. Do I believe that her intentions were pure when she came in? A hundred percent. My fear is, is I don't know how long you've been this way. That's what I'm saying. So I can't do a more likely than not thing with her because at this point, it's tainted and it's a shame because if this was the only fuck up she had, it's tainting her legacy when it comes to BLM. And I'm separating her from the other um, organizers. That's the problem with this. You're probably right, but that's hard for me to see right now. Uh, Antonio Brown had some thoughts about Colin Kaepernick. Donnie, run the thoughts. We don't feel sorry for you. You took the deal. Yeah. Fuck out of here. <laughs> oh, Kaepernick, man, Kaepernick. you on fucking Nike, man. Yeah. Fuck out of here. You don't feel you. He good. You think he good? Cause yeah, I was yeah, he like, good. But you know the nigga want to get back in the nah, league, bro. Nah, he don't want to play, man. He was trash, everything. He was trash? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I'm about trash. He was all right. Come on, AB. Man, listen, he man. Was all right, AB. Kaepernick did all that and took the money and then got the commercials. We don't see Kaepernick outside. Where he at? I ain't never seen him outside. I never seen him outside. All right, so like, don't even say. I see him throwing the ball, trying to get back in, though. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, but he already took the money. All oh, that's cap. Like, mm. we ain't respecting that, bro. You took the money, the commercials. Yeah. We don't see you outside. We don't see him in the hood. He don't do nothing. Like, yeah. we cool, but now nah, we ain't even saying Kaepernick. He not even from the hood. He don't even. The trenches, yeah. Like we like Kevin Nick and all, but like yeah. we ain't, we ain't really on that. So as black people, we need to get that clear, mm. cause like when we have moments, ain't nobody giving us no nothing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. like, yeah. He took the hand out, so he got to take the man out. Okay. Go ahead. You go ahead. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You go. You go. No, Cap go. is. Yeah, I know you, you know, I'm waiting for you to say, you know, you know, Cap and NASA. And Natalia being <laughs> victimized. Oh, Turn it off! that's scary. <laughs> okay, so, so, so this is what I'd say. First of all, let's consider the fact that Antonio Brown is a fucking idiot. Okay. Yeah, let's consider the source. All right, let's just um, start there. But I'm not saying that he's not smart. I'm saying that he's a fucking idiot. When I say he's an idiot, he does idiot shit. But that doesn't mean that what Antonio Brown is saying in this video is not a refrain that you hear from people all the time, if I'm being honest. So besides the disrespectful nature in which he talks about Kaepernick, Mm -hmm. if you listen to what he said is that he doesn't see Kaepernick outside enough. Um, that Kaepernick took a deal. All right, so this is what I would say. Since I always got to hold the water of Colin Kaepernick and 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 Nessa, who are people that I believe. Once again, I believe that every I believe that people are trying, and sometimes they don't do things in completely the right way, and that we should try to 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 have some nuance. But let, let me say what I would say. Number one, they are outside, okay, and they mm-hmm. have something called the Know Your Rights Camp. That up until the time that the pandemic came around, the Know Your Rights Camp would go from city to city to city to city. Uh, and talking to young black kids, I always well, I say young black kids, talking to black kids about their rights and bringing different speakers in, okay? I've raised money with the Know Your Rights Camp before the Know Your Rights Camp, and that's what the Know Your Rights Camp would do. Colin Kaepernick raised a million dollars, uh, got a fucking plane uh, to send places he would, where he would, the, the, the Know Your Rights Camp, his, his, uh, his organization would 
uh, go buy suits for guys that were getting out of jail. Donate those suits to them. It's one of the things that they do so, so they can go on job interviews and help curb recidivism. They have been out there. But there is a visible way that the Black community sometimes needs people to be out there that if you could criticize Colin, that people would say that maybe they haven't seen him as much lately. And that's something that I've heard from other people. Now, I know what's, I knows what, what have, what's going on. And I know what goes on behind the scenes and all the work that they do. So I don't think that that's true, but that's not something that's like alien. It's not, but I also don't think it's something that's fair. I don't think that you always Neither need to I. see what somebody's doing for them to actually be doing something. And we got to get off that. We got to get off. If I don't see them out and about, or if you see them doing something that's outside of the cause, then all of a sudden they're not down for it anymore. And we got to remove ourselves from that. I don't know everything that Cap is doing, but I know he does a lot. And because I know that he is doing something, then I'm not one to criticize what it is that he's doing. I don't think that's fair to say. Now, I have questioned why would he want to go back in a league that he's criticized so much? I, I ask you that question, but I'm not faulting him. If he does want to go back into the league, I'm not faulting him for taking money. He was there was collusion. He did. He definitely should have been paid out for that. And good for him for calling out the organization and demanding exactly what he deserved. They ruined his career just for standing up for what he believed in. So I have no problem with him wanting to get back in the league, but I don't think it's fair to say, oh, you can't because you took this money or you're or just now say you're not doing anything just because you don't know their every single move. We got to get off that. And before you do speak on what someone's not doing, tell me what research you've done to actually see what it is that they're involved in and what they're doing or what they're not. So this is the problem. This is the issue. That's very well said. This is the problem. This is the issue. The, um, the problem and the issue is he's speaking for a group of people that they're super visual and they're, they're headline hungry. So. Uh, one Glad thing that the internet is, like, yeah, one thing that the internet has been able to do is, hey, there's a narrative that's been created. Kaepernick took a settlement with the NFL. He shouldn't have done it. Now, when the settlement first, ha first happened, even I was like, whoa, I thought we weren't doing that. You know what I mean? I really did until I had to understand what was going on. That was a workplace. Give an example of somebody right now, your friend Sage Steele, she's suing ESPN. She works there. Yeah. All right, you would think that, hey, if you're going to sue a place that you wouldn't want to work there, she's suing ESPN, she works there. To me, that's freedom. So I don't have any problem <laughs> with what's going on now. I do think, though, that um, for me, Kaepernick's desire to play in the NFL doesn't have anything to do with leadership. It has to do with, to me, setting a standard of what you should have to sacrifice to do the right thing. He, should, he just shouldn't have to give up football because he did the right thing. If the league is racist and he wants to play in the re hey, shit is fucked up. You know, like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, shit is yeah. fucked up. Motherfuckers is tweeting right now. Elon Musk runs it. Get the fuck off Twitter. You know what I'm saying? So, so what I'm saying is, is, like, he shouldn't have to. We don't have a lot of those systems where we are. We don't have control over the fact that they're rooted in racism. Yeah, you know? right. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, I look at stuff like this, and I'm like, there's got to be a better way for us to discuss one another. You know, and when I say once again, when I say Antonio Brown is an idiot, I'm not saying that he's not smart. I'm saying that he does idiot fucking shit. Right. At this one, we got to consider the source in it. But I, you know how I feel about the people. Yes, but you know how I feel about the people too who are in the room with him talking about mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like challenge him on that. Ask him a question. Don't just be a yes man in that situation. Because you got Antonio Brown on your podcast. If he was here having that same conversation, it would not have gone the same. That's not what niggas say. That's not what the street said. Okay, play this. There's a new... Uh, okay, so give me this. So, uh, Donnie, just... <laughs> no, give me, give me this clip. <laughs> Donnie, you know Donnie the traitor. Self-pity or be a mentality of being victimized. There's no racism. You can't do what you want in America and the world. Only you can breathe for yourself and like only you can see what your own eyes. So it's up to what you want. I made a hundred million dollars in like football contracts. What nigga? I have a good Nobody question. gonna fuck with us. Um, what nigga? We do what we want. When was nigga. that? It's the same. It seems like it's the same interview. Is it not, Donnie? No, it's from the We in Miami podcast. Okay, I don't, I don't, I don't. But it's recent. It's yeah. It just came out. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, now, I mean, again, I'll be consider the be source. To these Knicks. I'll be listening consider to these the Knicks. source. They good. <laughs> you know, it's just so weird. Like, no, it don't. It don't. It don't exist for you, and it does exist, but you don't feel it. You fast twitch nigga. You can run fast, and they pay you. Like everybody else, got to deal with shit. There's people that work. I'm in New Orleans right now. Let me tell you something. So I notice how America works. When I'm in LA and I go places, I'm used to seeing a certain ethnicity in the service industry. It lets you know the difference in LA. I see my Hispanic brothers and sisters in service industry positions, Mm -hmm. but I'm in Los Angeles, right? They are your valets. They are your cooks. They are your workers at fast food restaurants. That's the way capitalism has kind of divvied things up in LA. When you're here in Louisiana, it's all black people, right? Like when you're here in New Orleans, where I'm at right now, and you walk through these different places, you walk through these neighborhoods, you see the very clear legacy of racism and capitalistic divide. When you're seeing it everywhere you go, your valet is black, the cook is black, everybody that works at the hotels, these are the jobs that people can get and they are filled with black faces. When you go to LA, they are filled with Hispanic faces. You know what I mean? So for somebody like Antonio Brown, who became a great athlete and didn't have the world sucking his dick for all of that time, might behoove you to open your eyes and see how other people who look like you are doing and remember what they're going to do to your ass. That's why I don't be going off for these niggas. When shit like that happens to these niggas, I don't go up and say, oh, it was so unfair the way they treated them. Nah, to me, that's saying stupid shit. Piss me off. <laughs> um, Okay, Sonny Hostin, go ahead. I know this may be a novel point, a, a novel idea for somebody who's, you know, a supporter of Trump, but there are people who are capable of relating I, and not having that I was ethical supporter interests. Of Trump. I don't, There's many I things imagine. that I don't stand by that Trump mm-hmm. did. Trump has done things that are racist. I'm a black woman first, so always understand that. Mm-hmm. But I do say that I have many conservative values that I will talk to you about. And so if you look at your network you that you're Republican? standing behind, yes, and when you look at your network that you're standing behind, you're saying that you look at Chris Cuomo. I feel like that's an oxymoron, a black Republican. You feel oh, like it's an oxymoron. I do. Why? Your friend right here is a Republican. We had She's this not, conversation many times. You do. Have and you say you feel like it's an oxymoron I don't, I don't that you're Catholic, but you also are pro life. I, I don't understand either. No, you, you don't understand yourself then. You have, you have disagreements. I understand you myself. Can, I don't understand I, either. This, but it's not a personal conversation. Yeah. We're going, I don't, like, we're, I we're having a personal conversation about, about CNN I, I don't and how black things Republicans can get leads. And I don't understand Latino Republicans. Well, here's I what I want to Today, this is not about me and it's not about you. It's about celebrating Corinne Jean Pierre. And I think we should. We can agree on that. Do you believe that you can be a black Republican? Yeah. You can be. You don't you don't believe it's an oxymoron? Explain to me what that means exactly. I mean, you want me to jump in Sonny's head? I, I, no, I, no, she, I mean, tell, tell me, what, first of all, I love this. Uh, there's this movie called Renaissance Man. Kadeem Hardison. Wait, who? The, the teacher put, the teacher, the, 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 Dan DeVito was a teacher. He put oxymoron. Wait on the thing and he said you can't do that you can't call me an oxymoron <laughs> did you think that was funny Trudy I don't give a fuck what Trudy thinks um, um I, I, I do this is what I I I guess this is what I understand with Sunny I think that she's right in terms of today mm-hmm. the way that the Republican Party stands It's one thing if you want to be black and conservative, but to be a black Republican, I understand what she's saying, because how could you do that when the Republican Party has continued to do things? Not even just recently, but fine, I will do within the last few years, has done things to completely put black people down or Latino people, because she she mentions both. So how can you stand there and say I'm black like. Like Lindsay says, I'm a black woman first. Well, how can you be so black and proud when the party that you want to attach to your name constantly puts black women down or black people down? Look at the Voting Rights Act. That's the reason that they're the ones changing it, which is continuing to hurt black and brown people. Justice and Policing Act. The Republicans voted against Ketanji Ketanji Brown Jackson on being on the Supreme Court. Like the list goes on and on and on about how that party has continued to hurt. You're the very people that that is you as a black woman. So how can you be both? 
that I understand. It has nothing to do with being conservative. It has nothing to, like conservative values. That's not the same thing. You are identifying yourself as a black woman to a specific party that has continued to put black people down. That is the contradicting contradiction in terms that I believe that Sonny Hoffman is referring to. Hmm. Uh, so yes, it's only a contradiction if you have the edict in yourself that you're going to do what's best for Black people. Which has, is what she presented to herself. I'm a Black woman first. Let's get that straight. Okay. Right. So, um, so this is why I, so I, I think that, so there's a, there's a huge correlation between Black Republicanship and white man's nigga syndrome, okay? But- it, Can we, it, it, we haven't had a podcast yeah. yet where we have not talked about <laughs> white man's yeah, nigga. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it doesn't always exist, right? Now we might have, so, and so I wanna leave this open to, for intellectual disagreement between people who are, uh, who are uh, politically, political adversaries, okay? Um, it's a good faith disagreement. So this is what I would say. There's a point that you get to when you're in a political machine, right? When you're part of a political uh, mechanism where you have to make decisions about who it is that you're gonna support and what it is that you want to blot out. And it's clear that the deeper you get into Republican politics, that they have to cater to a base that is just inherently racist. They have to cater to a base that just forget about facts and figures. They just don't want niggas to have shit. It's just a reality. And that's both contemporarily and historically in America. Just don't want niggas to have shit because they're black. I'm sorry, guys, that's a fact. However, there are people out there who just don't believe what I believe fiscally. They don't believe what I believe morally. They don't believe what I believe socially. And some of those people are black. You and I have enough differences to where um, there are things that even though we're both, we, we align politically a lot, there are things between us that we would have to legislate. So the question is, how far does that go until you're betraying something? If you actually think that, if you actually think that America would be better off deregulating everything, right? And, uh, to, to like to taking away any sort of tax burden on the rich, if you actually foolheartedly enough believe that that grows the American economy and that that, econ that economic growth would be good for Black people, then I can debate you on that, right? I, we can go back and forth with that. And you could be Black and think that. And you could be Black and look at the seven mystic years and look at the history of, Republi of the Republican Party and, and choose to turn a blind eye to all of these other things and think, hey, pull yourself up. Yo, that could happen. There could be Black Republicans who are not super duper uh, Uncle Tom's. Here's the point, though. There always comes a tipping point, right? Mm -hmm. There always comes mm -hmm. a tipping point where your people need something. To, and they're Black. It is not because they're poor. And it's not because they live on this side of town. It's they're Black. Like, Black people need something. And can you convince your party to stand up for those people because they're black and will you, are you li willing to lay it on the line for them? I will tell you something though. That exists with the Democrats too. That exists on both sides of this. So the only thing I don't like about this, even though intellectually she would tend to be right, is that this further deepens to me the alignment between black America and the Democratic Party and I don't think that's serving us. I understand what you mean by that. And I will agree to that. But I guess for term, in terms of argument's sake and the way that I guess what the topic of discussion is with this, that's why I separate being conservative versus identifying with a specific party. And of course, the Democratic Party has done things to hurt the Black community and the Brown community. But at the same time, I think one does more harm than the other especially if you're looking at it just specifically right now with some of the bigger issues. So I, that's why I understand where Sonny is coming from, because it wasn't that she said I'm black and conservative. She said, I'm black and I'm Republican. She proudly identified and aligned herself with a party 
That's a very important distinction. That, that's the problem. I feel like with what Lindsay was saying and why Sunny responds specifically in that way. You know, she didn't get into it necessarily with Anna, who is also a Republican, but doesn't necessarily. I can't. The faces. I can't. I'm I don't listening know what's to happening. You. <laughs> like my gums are like, well, I'm listening to you. My gums are tingling for some reason. I don't know. Maybe I got gingy. <laughs> Something's wrong. My gums are tingling. I'm listening. <laughs> I literally was distracted. I'm not mad at you. I just was so distracted by mm-hmm. your faces that Something's you were making. With my I didn't know right if now. I should be concerned or what. <laughs> Anyways, you got it. Yeah, but I agree with Sunny. In this in this moment, I agree with Sunny. And I wish um, that they had gotten into this on the view instead of just moving on to the next topic. I think it would have been an interesting debate. I would love to hear from Lindsay. The smoke. I would love to hear Lindsay talk about that. Black Republicans, uh, come on the show. We've already had one and it went great. <laughs> <laughs> we should have her come back. When we did should, she run? Wait, did she already run? I don't know what that she ran in, I think this year. I think I'm not sure. I have to look. I don't think it but was all, you, I think it was in March. I I'll, I'll tell you this though. We we can't do the thing to where in the black community anymore. We have to make sure that we're not taking a blood oath to one political party. It doesn't mean that you have to vote for a Republican. It just means don't fawn over it. Don't be, we, at this point, we can't be proud Democrats. I really don't think we can. Even if we are Democrats, we can't be proud Democrats. We have to make sure that we keep enough emotional distance between us and that party that we can continue to make them do the things that we need them to do. Speaking of Democrats, we were planning to have someone come on the podcast. We've been looking for this person to describe to you guys. And and, and there's a great Vox article. I don't want to butcher anything. I'm sure Rachel doesn't either. Uh, We want to make sure that people know what steps Biden could take to, Uh to, um, if there's anything that the president can do unilaterally to head off this road thing. Uh, This is a major moment in American history. And I think it's important for us to make sure that our our audience knows whether or not the president has, he doesn't have a silver bullet, definitely, but if he has any bullets at all. So we're not- He has to, because McConnell's already out here talking about what will happen if Republicans win the midterm and take over Congress again, Mm -hmm. take over the Senate. He's already talking about a national ban, what what Congress plans to do. Why? Like, he's already talking about this. Not just, a, not, just a, not just a national ban, by the way. He's talking about not just a national ban, but they want to ban condoms. Shit! It, it's only... It's, <laughs> God damn. Like, not only is people going to be pregnant, they're going to be burning. Jesus Christ. It, it's it's going to be nuts in this bitch. Like, people walking around, be- <laughs> dripping, drip, 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 drip. Drip below the end. It's gonna be like it's it's gonna be oh, it's, gross. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Oh, I stole another song. I stole, <laughs> I, I stole, oh, this is breaking right now. Oh, no. Trudy just put something new. What happened? Hey, what is this? Uh-oh. It's breaking. What is it? What is this? Good grief! Oh fuck! Read it. Rappers Young Thug and Gunna among 28 defendants charged in 56 count indictment in Fulton County. The the 56 count grand jury indictment charges 28 members and associates of Young Slime Life, YSL. That is a gang in Atlanta, no other way to say it, that Young Thug has been associated with. The indictment includes charges of conspiring to violate the racketeer influence. Corrupt Organizations Act, of that is, of course, the RICO Act, murder, armed robbery, participation in criminal street gang activity. Photojournalists captured this exclusive in- image of authorities taking Young Thug into custody earlier this evening. According to the 56-count indictment, Young Thug is facing charges of participation in street gang activity and conspiring to violate the, racket- the RICO Act, of course. Um, blah, blah, blah. 88-page indictment. Young Thug is in there. 
He's accused of renting a 2014 Infiniti Q50 sedan from Hertz, which was used in the commission of the murder of Donovan Thomas Jr., a rival gang member on I-1015, according to the indictment. That puts, oh shit, don't, why would I explain that? Legally, what does that mean for Young Thug, Rach? Wait, which part were you reading? Sorry, I was so, jumping to the second murder so, attempt and why if uh F in Lucci while he was in jail. Well, Lucci, well, Lucci's actually, I'll be honest with you guys, Lucci's people reached out to me and wanted me to talk about the fact that they, that Lucci was that there was an attempt, there was an attempted murder made upon Lucci in jail. If you guys do not know, there is a bitter rivalry between YSL and the YFM crew going on right now in Atlanta. It's been happening. Um, it's been happening for a, a, a very long time. These are two rival gangs. Wife and Lucci is one is, is, is obviously one gang. Young Thug is in the other gang. And there was talk that there these guys are going back and forth. And it seems as if right now, prosecutors alleged that two associates of YSL, Kristen Eppinger and Antonio Sumlin, were to get the permission of Young Thug to make an accept, second attempt to murder Wife and Lucci. Wife and Lucci while he's jailed in Fulton County. He was stabbed not too long ago. Jesus Christ, man. 28 defendants. Somebody's going to take the charge for um, Young Thug and Gun. It's a Rico. I... Oh, did you say Rico? Yeah, it's a Rico. I literally, every time you were reading, I was like down further. I didn't even, also, oh, I was like, Oh, no, a... they can't, can't nobody take shit. Murder, saw, yeah. I didn't even see the Rico part. Yeah, it's a, can't, nobody can't take shit. It's a Rico. That's a conspiracy shit. If they can They've been watching this nigga them for a long, for a long time. time. This is Rico is a long time. So, oh. so, you know, can't nobody, mm. nobody can't drop off shit. If they can prove any of this shit and they can prove a criminal conspiracy, Young Thug and Gunna gone for a little while. I'm not saying it's Gunna, gonna happen. Gunna's a, Gunna's a part of YSL. Nah, he's with he's with he's with Thug. Oh, I but thought I they were in YSL. No. Oh, excuse me, Who's, YSL. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, YSL. So hold on, and this is the feds, y'all. This is bad. This is six. Bad. Let me make sure. That, yeah, this is the, this. And they this were the indicted. Feds. They were indicted by a grand this, jury. Oh, this yeah. is the feds. This is bad. This is bad. Duh. Right here. Like, so for sure. Rico, murder, armed robbery, and participation in criminal, criminal street gang activity. So explain to me this, though, because I want to know this from you right now. So if you are, if Young Thug rents a car, from Hertz, which was used in the commission of the murder, they have to be able to prove, can your involvement in that just be that you were in the gang? Is that the way the RICO works? Or do they have to prove that he rented the car knowing that the car was gonna be in commission of a murder? Well, I would, I, I do not know RICO at okay. all, but I would imagine that there has to be some tie you can't, I would imagine that if you rent a car and then somebody else, like if you're asleep and somebody takes it and drives it and does something, whatever, like there has to be some way that you prove the connection. But I don't know because I don't know Rico. So I don't want to say the wrong thing. But the reality of the situation is what I'm saying is that if they prove it, it's going to be hard to divorce the fact. And by the way, I don't want to see nobody go to jail. So I'm just putting this out here. It's going to be hard to divorce from the fact that you're, if they can prove he's in that gang and the gang used the car to commit a murder and he rented it, I don't, it's it's the nuts. ongoing criminal activity that's going to be the issue. And that's why both of us at the same time were like, they've been following them for a long time. That's what that, that's what this shows, because it's an ongoing thing when it involves Rico. So. Mm. Hey, you know what we haven't paid attention to? What? They are coming for these niggas. I want you to think about this. So in the last they are coming for these niggas. Like in the last, I'd say, let's go back three years and look at who's fallen. You had, well, actually, let's go back further than that. You had GS9, that was Bobby Schmurder in them. That was the first big one, right? In terms of rappers claiming gangs and being part of these situations, GS9, Bobby Schmurder situation, they went through, got them out of the paint for a long time. Bobby came home last year. Okay, cool. After that, no sooner than Takashi popped off Holland Treyway and all of that stuff, 
that they go out and get all of the Treyway guys wrapped up together on an indictment, flip him, and then use him to put Shadi and them all in jail, right? After that, you had Casanova and those guys up there. I think that was either last year or the year before last. You had Casanova and all of those guys up there in the organization that he's a part of in New York. Feds got to them. Cass is locked up right now, rolled them all up on organized crime charges, right? Now you have YSL. And if you ask me, YFM is to, to follow. You have YSL kind of like getting locked up and caught up on an indictment right now. These are very, they are not fucking, they're not playing with these motherfuckers. All of these guys claiming all of this criminal shit and getting together under the same banner. Everybody might need to chill a little bit because they come in for these guys. This will be like, if they get to them, this will be like the fourth rap crew slash gang that they have knocked off. And I'm probably missing some. Mm. Yeah. Nuts. Yeah. Y'all need nuts, nuts, nuts. The guy's name is Michael Seiden. He is a reporter. Okay, if you want more updates from this, go to Michael Seiden right now. Michael Seiden is uh, um, prosecutor Sergio Gunner Kitchens, associate with YSL, accused of appearing in video released on social media titled Fox 5, wearing a YSL pendant and a slap pendant with Larry saying that we got 10 round choppers. I don't know if they're going to be able to get Gunner because Gunner is not I don't know if they're going to be able to get done. Um, but this is nuts. Okay, we got to go. Uh, before we go, I, wanted to, I do want to I, I do want to say something real quick. Okay. Um, uh, Southern University cheerleader named Arlana Miller. She was a freshman. She was from Texas. She was on the cheerleading team. Uh, she posted on social media a goodbye letter to everyone in her life, and then she took her life. Um, I went to Southern University. Uh, this is not necessarily the type of thing that Jaguar Nation is used to dealing with. Um, there was no social media when, when I was going there. Uh, that was a little college club or whatever, uh, MySpace maybe. But um, the entire community, I'm, I'm back home now, I'm in Louisiana, the entire community is, is hurt. This, Young lady's life mattered, even if she didn't think that it did. I'm not going to read her final uh, Instagram post that she put out, but she was sad, but felt like she had no other way out. Uh, she talked about things that had gone on with her, about how tough COVID was and the fact that she had torn her ACL. And it seemed like that um, she was teetering for a while, but things just... Um, Things just got too hard for her. I don't know what to say except for to, to say something to remember her right now and just acknowledge her uh, because her life did matter. Um, she was important to a lot of people. Uh, and there were a lot of people who wanted to see her go on and find happiness and grow older. And um achieve some of the things that she had gone to college to achieve. So uh, that has been very tough for a lot of people. And I don't know how to button this and tell people that it's going to be okay. Um, I just know that it can. I know firsthand that it can get better. And if you are listening to us, Rach and I, whether we bicker or whether we're together, we both know that it can get better. And I know that I care about you and love you, you know, whoever you are. And I would just hope that you care about yourself and love yourself and give yourself a clear out every now and again. It's tough. It's tough. It's very tough. Very, very tough. Very tough. So I have to take some time and acknowledge that. I'm so glad that you did. I'm glad that you did. I'm glad that you acknowledged her. I didn't even, I didn't know until you told me. And I think that it's important to recognize her just like you just did. Um, okay, so look, this is Van's very serious question of the week. Go ahead. It's a very serious question. First of all, do you eat breakfast? Do you like breakfast foods? I do. Okay. Is the best waffle in the world? 
I don't eat waffles. Better than the worst pancake. I don't eat pancakes. But if I have to choose. No, I don't want you to do it. I don't fucking <laughs> want you to do it. I don't want you to do it. Nigga, where's the fun, Rachel? Do you eat a I biscuit? Do you eat I a biscuit? Not for, not on, yes, I do eat biscuits. Let me just say that. Yes, I eat biscuits. My mom grew up making really good pancakes. There is just something that's too doughy to me about a oh pancake God. and you know a what? waffle that makes me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I can't hear you. I took my headphones off. I, I know do you did. I don't. I, I, I don't. I, I, you know what I'm saying, nigga. I don't. I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to do it. Like it's just you. You. God damn it, Rach. What's your answer? I don't want to do it. No, nope, no. Nope. Van's very serious question is. Van's very serious question is who's holier, Jesus or Moses? We've changed. <laughs> Like we, we've changed the question. We're gonna, we're like, we've changed it. <laughs> because think about it. Moses mattered. That's what I'm saying. Um, all right, we got to go. Take, Put your keep, headphones on. Yeah. Okay. I'm back. Okay. I'm sorry. Next time I'll lie to you. I'll lie. Di- no, no, I'll I don't dig, want you to. I'll dig in real no. deep and find my Patrice colors in me and I'll tell you what you want to hear. What if, what if she was having pancake parties in the house? That would be so dope <laughs> to go to a pancake social at the Black Lives Matter house. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Fuck! All right, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta, we gotta go. We gotta go. Rachel, take us out. Tell them bye. Take the videos off. Do not stop learning. I'm Rachel and Lindsay. I'm Van. He's Van Lathan Jr. Do, bye, guys. You better, man. <laughs>